Hey booktube, hey friends, how's everybody doing? I wanted to make a video about my best books, um, my best fiction books rather, of 2020. Um, and since it's already into the first week of January, I feel like uh, I better do that before too much more time elapses and we get into the middle of the year and I still haven't done that. I've been known to do that um, in years past. Um, but before I do, I, I wanted to just say a few words about um, what happened yesterday here in America. Um, it was, as everyone probably already knows, um, you know, there was a breach on our Capitol um, where our elected officials were um, ratifying, you know, certifying the vote of the Electoral College in our recent presidential election. And during that um, time, there were a there was a mob of domestic terrorists who um, breached the Capitol steps, uh, got inside the Capitol, and um, you know paraded through, where you know, holding Confederate flags and going into um, you know Speaker Pelosi's office, and just watching all of this unfold in real time was just incredibly disturbing, um, to say the least. It was, um, you know, a very unsettling, horrifying day uh, that was completely predictable because anyone who has paid any attention to what, um, you know, what, what our president, our so-called president, has been uh, advocating for the last four or five years, um, even before he was even considering running for president. I mean, this is a guy who has spent, you know, years um, denouncing President Obama's, um, you know, where he was born, um, you know, constant calls, you know, calling for Hillary Clinton to be locked up. Um, it, it just, I can't even begin to go into the litany of outrages that, that we have been subject to from this man. And yesterday, I think, was the culminating point um, for a lot of people. And it, frankly, it just comes four years too late um, because, you know, all of the Republicans right now who are denouncing what happened yesterday in the Capitol, it's just, you know, it's just too late for them to grow a spine and to begin and pretend to feel outrage over this when there has just been countless examples of times when he they could have um, you know spoken out about this and certainly there have been some that have but um, you know the hypocrisy of that is just really unsettling to say the least and it's also goes without saying too that you know the way that these um, these individuals were treated is vastly different than it would have been if they were black protesters. And we've seen that happen. Um, we've seen, um, you know, other protesters be, you know, fired on with tear gas and when they were protesting peacefully. And this was not a peaceful protest um, by any means. So it, it was a sad day. It was um, a terrifying day, but it was also one that was also predictable. Um, sadly enough. I hope, um, you know, I am a big proponent and a big fan of our incoming president, Joe Biden. I have loved Joe for years, decades, and I have like the fullest confidence that he will be what he is the person we need at this moment in time. I know that a lot of people don't really agree with me on that. Um, that he wasn't their first choice. He was always my first choice. And, you know, these next 13 days cannot pass soon enough. Um, you know, I fear for what, you know, our current president can do at the, this time. So anyway, uh, enough of that. It is just like, like I said, it's just a completely sobering and upsetting time um, in our country right now. So Anyway, on to the best fiction of 2020 that I read. Um, I read 58 books in 2020, and surprisingly, only 22 of them were fiction, um, which is 
uh, only 38% of my reading. And I generally read a lot more fiction than that. And I don't know why my nonfiction was just so much more, you know, in quantity this year. I mean, you would think that after the year that we just experienced in 2020, that um, I would have wanted to escape more into fiction and um, not be too consumed with real life things. But, um, but that just, that's not the way it went. But anyway, so without further ado, so the first book, um, and I only have um, six books for you for my best fiction of 2020. So um, the first one is An American Marriage by Tehari Jones. Um, I was not sure whether I would like this or not. Uh, I had picked up Silver Sparrow a few years back and I really, I really couldn't get into it. And in fact, Silver Sparrow was a um, DNF one for me. And so I wasn't sure about this one, but I really fell in love with this book uh, almost immediately. Um, it is about a young married couple named Celestial and Roy, and uh, she is from a wealthy family in Atlanta, and he is from a working class background in Louisiana. So like I said, they're a young married couple, and they're visiting um, Roy's hometown when he is uh, falsely accused of rape, and he is um, sentenced to 12 years in, in jail. And so during that time, you know, their relationship is obviously tested um, and C Celestial is, you know, torn between, uh, well, she be starts, she becomes torn between, um, you know, remaining loyal to Roy, who she really hasn't had a chance, they really haven't had a chance to, um, you know, build a life together. Um, this incident happened so soon after they were married and, um, so so she she's kind of torn between that like does she start her life all uh, anew she a new fresh fresh start or does she remain loyal to um to the man she you know she took as her husband and or you know so this the writing in this was absolutely wonderful i should also say too that her family also paid for the lawyer who really worked on his case um relentlessly and so that really brings up a lot of themes of family and race and class, um, incarnation and injustice and injustice and love. Um, this book really has everything. And I think it is such a powerful, powerful book. The character development was fantastic. Um, there were times when I absolutely loved Celestial. Um, there were times where I hated her. And I think that that is such a great mark of a writer to be able to do that within, you know, the same character. Um, the writing was wonderful. Um, th this one won the Women's Prize for Fiction in 2019. Um, and it was, like I said, it was just a phenomenal read. Um, I listened to this one on audio, which I would also really recommend if you can. Um, I think I thought the audio production of this book was fantastic. Um, I originally, I read this for um, an online book club, Doing It in the Nook, uh, which is hosted by one of my favorite authors, Kelly Corrigan. Um, love every word that she writes. Um, I love Kelly. She is a Philly girl like me. And um, she grew up in the same area where I went to college. And um, so I, I, I just, I love everything about her. Um, so, so the book club Doing It in the Nook is hosted by Kelly Corrigan, like I said, and singer-songwriter Matt Nathanson, who I also love. So anyway, um, this was our the first pick of the book club for January of last year, I believe. But sadly, the book club is on hiatus. Um, they haven't really um, picked a book for the last couple of months, which is kind of a bummer because the online conversations were great and Kelly and Matt would jump in and at one point Matt Nathanson like referenced me by name and I was all fangirly and it was great so but anyway highly recommend An American Marriage Tayari Jones fantastic fantastic book if you haven't already read it 
So my second book of my best fiction of 2020 was Pretty Things by Janelle Brown. I loved the cover of this. Um, I had gotten an arc of this for review and I um, sadly didn't get around to doing the review. I really regret that and hopefully, um, you know, I've been writing about this one in my blog a couple times and um, so hopefully that all makes up for that. I always feel bad when I get an ARC for review and I don't get a chance to write the, get around to doing the review and it's a book that I've really loved. It's different if it's a book that you're kind of so-so about or you really didn't like or it was a complete DNF, but when it's a book that is so wonderful and you don't get around to doing the review, it's kind of like makes you feel kind of bad but anyway pretty things by janelle brown um this was really different than what i typically read i usually read a lot of literary fiction um a lot of short story collections um a lot of memoir and this was a psychological suspense thriller type of book and i loved it it was it just sucked me in right away it was fantastic i thought it was it was just great um it is a twisting and a twisted um story about these two women uh, nina and vanessa um it's set in lake tahoe and um but before that it's set in i believe california or maybe like portland somewhere on the west coast but Anyway, so Nina is a, uh, a young woman who has an art history background. She went to a fancy liberal arts college and she um, just hasn't been able to find like a career that um, she just has, has, it hasn't worked out for her. So she becomes a con artist and a grifter along with her um, Irish boyfriend, Lachlan. And um, she does so mainly because her mother is dying. She has cancer and um, the health insurance, I, I don't remember whether they don't have health insurance or whether health insurance doesn't cover the bills. But anyway, the mother is an, undergoing some very expensive treatments and Nina has to pay for them, like out of pocket. And so she turns to um, being a grifter. So she'll go out to like nightclubs and, you know, scam, um, you know, these men, um, and like go back to their house and like steal everything in them. Or like she plots these, these heists, uh, over a period of weeks. And I, and I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Um, and so Vanessa is, um, among, she's one of the wealthy Liebling family members. So, okay. So the, this family, they kind of reminded me a little bit like Kardashians a little bit. I think that that might have been kind of where Janelle Brown was going with this one. Um, I, I'm not sure. I don't know that for a fact. But anyway, um, so she is an heiress. Um, there's like a gazillions of money in this family. And she, you know, wants to, she's trying to figure out how she can, you know, make her mark on the world and leave a legacy and you know, whatever, but she becomes an Instagram influencer. So she's traveling all around the world and, you know, being photographed and doing selfies in on beaches and with different product placements and all that crap. And, um, and so she had, so she suffers like a, a broken engagement and she like retreats to her family's estate, um, which is all run down and all kind of creepy, you know, um, which is in Lake Tahoe. So she goes, she goes there to kind of, I guess, get herself together, whatever. So anyway, um, okay. So the way that the, their two lives intersect is that Nina has some kind of, some connection to this family, to Vanessa's family. Um, I can't really give that away because that's probably going to be giving away too much, many spoilers, but anyway, suffice it to say that the, these two families are connected, um, and the way that Janelle Brown unravels that story and brings that into the future and kind of plays with time from going back in time, I believe it's about 12 years um, in the past, 
and it, it's just absolutely fascinating. I'm just looking at my notes to see if there's anything else that I wanted to say about it, but this has really, this has really made me want to read more psychological thrillers like this, and like I said, I love the cover. I think it's one of the most beautiful covers that I, uh, of a book that I read last year, and I just loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. I want to read everything else by her. I want to read similar books uh, like this. So if you've read Pretty Things and you have other recommendations um, for ones that you think I might like that are along these lines, I would love to, to see them in the comments. So um, anyway, Pretty Things by Vanessa Brown, uh, Vanessa Brown, by Janelle Brown. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's all I wanted to say about that one. Anyway, so great, great book. But then when I don't have the actual, um, picture of, but I'll put it, uh, I'll put a photo in the video. And, um, that is the white card and that is a play. It's a one act play by Claudia Rankine. Um, she is, you know, most famously known for the books, uh, Citizen and her most recent book, Just Us. And um, so this is a one act play that um, was inspired by a question that a white man posed to her um, during an event. And um, in her words, it explores what happens if one is willing to stay in the room when it is painful to bear to hear the pressure let me start that again. Okay. Um, it explores what happens if one is willing to stay in the room when it is painful to bear the pressure to listen and the obligation to respond. And so it's about this couple um, who, it's, they're a wealthy couple in Manhattan and the husband is an art collector and he collects art by black artists and he um you know he's very it, it, it basically talks about performative um activism and he he does this uh he, so they have this this dinner party for this up-and-coming author of uh, up-and-coming artist um named charlotte and during the dinner party, the real motivations behind the reason he is collecting this art are, is revealed. And again, the way that um, Claudia Rankin do, does this is fantastic. Um, the, there's, the, there's their art dealer is part of this dinner party. His name is Eric. He's very calculating. He's very cold and very standoffish. Um, the, and then their son, Alex, the, this couple's son, um, Virginia and Charles Spencer, that's the couple's name. Um, their son makes an appearance. He come, he comes in and he is incredibly woke. He is like, right. He's just come from an anti-Trump protest. And, um, so he kind of turns everything on its head. So it's a two act play. It's a two scene play. So it's a one act play in two scenes. The first scene is this, like I said, this dinner party that happens. And then the second scene, it happens a year later. Um, and like I said, it, it's one that is very thought provoking. Um, and I don't want to say too much more about it because first of all, I read it earlier in the year and it's also probably one that is well worth going back and reading again. Um, I, I think that it, it was definitely, definitely, um, one that, that I liked. My fourth book, uh, is another one that I don't have a, a physical copy of. Um, but, uh, it is a girl, the girl from Widow Hills by Megan Miranda. And again, similar to Pretty Things, it is a psychological thriller. So, you know, I have six books on my best of fiction, best fiction of 2020 list, and two of them um, are psychological thrillers. So I don't know what the hell I was thinking this, this year, but that, that for whatever reason was what I was gravitating to. So um, I have some notes um, 
about this one that I took. I took some notes on it when I was reading. I think I read this one probably around like May, maybe July, something like that. But anyway, um, the first line was, I knew she was gone before I woke. Um, and it is the first, the first line is very important because, okay. So let me back up with this story. So girl from, from Widow Hills. So it starts out like 20 years ago. There is this six year old girl named Arden who it was a rainstorm and she had been sleepwalking and she gets swept away in the middle of the night. And you know, a search is ongoing for her. They can't find her. And, um, they finally find her, um, clutching to a storm drain and um, so the girl becomes famous and you know every year on the anniversary there is like retrospectives of the event and where she is now and how she's doing and after 20 years like after a certain amount of time like this all becomes too much right and also like her mom uh, her mother had capitalized on the event she wrote a book, she became famous, she went on the talk shows and all that. And that kind of led to an estrangement between the mother and the daughter. So, um, so like I said, it took three days for them to find her in the storm drain. And I was kind of getting, um, I was kind of thinking a lot about the case um, years ago. And I don't even know how many years ago, well, 30 maybe, of, um, the girl who fell down the well, um, you know, I believe her name is Jessica and, um, you know, she just, and it just kind of captivated everyone. And so every so often you hear, you know, a news story or something about how she's doing or whatever. Um, so I kind of was thinking of that real life situation w with this book, but anyway, so as time goes on, you know, after this whole, si whole thing happens, um, Arden moves away. Um, so Widow Hills is in is a fictional town in Kentucky, and she moves to North Carolina, changes her name, gets a job in a hospital. Um, but on the twentieth anniversary of this event, or right around it, she starts sleepwalking again, and she sleepwalks out into her backyard, and she stumbles upon like the dead body of somebody she knows. And so her neighbor gets involved and it becomes a whole, uh, a, a whole saga. But then there's also this story of her mother and she's received a, a box from her mother of her mother's belongings. So she knows that her mother is, is uh, her mother's dead. Um, it is just really fascinating. Um, again, just like Janelle Brown, I'm now hooked on Megan Miranda's work and I want to go back and read all of her thrillers. Um, I, I just thought this one was really suspenseful. I did not expect the ending at all. Um, same with Pretty Things. I was not expecting that at all. And um, I just thought it was it was a really fascinating book. I just um, looking real quickly with my notes to see um, what I said. Yeah, I wrote about the atmospheric writing oh my god it was just it was it was almost palpable really the the atmospheric writing in this one um, the descriptions were like spot on um, and it really talked to it really um, had like a lot of themes of like childhood trauma um, really were very very emphasized in in this one so um i thought that this was a fantastic fantastic book um, i feel like like most other i saw other booktubers videos in their best ofs that they felt like they kept repeating themselves and i feel like i'm doing the same thing because you know of course they're fantastic and powerful books because they wouldn't be our best ofs if they weren't right so anyway um so one of the things that one of the quotes that I had written down from this was a story about you doesn't necessarily belong to you. It belongs to the writer, to the witness, to the teller. Um, and um, the trauma buried under so many layers that it exists only in the physiological re reactions. Um, 
So anyway, uh, the girl from Widow Hills, um, fa fabulous, fabulous book. Um, okay, my next book, my fifth one, um, my of my best fictions, is The Harpy, um, which is by Megan Hunter. Um, Megan, uh, she wrote. She wrote a previous book, The End of Something, something, I don't remember. But anyway, The Harpy, it has an amazing cover. I think it, it, it is a, it's just a fantastic cover. And um, so it draws on the mythology of what a harpy is. And it is, it's just defined as a ravenous ma monster with a woman's head and bird's wings and claws. So that describes the main character, um, Lucy, who is a married young mother of twin boys. Um, and she finds out that her husband, Jake, is having an affair. And he's not really having an affair with, um, you know, some young chippy from his office, but from with another woman who's uh, a bit older and sophisticated. And um, so anyway, so she... she kind of spirals a little out of control with that news and which comes from uh, a phone call from Jake from um from the has from the person he's cheating on whose name I'm not remembering I want to say it's also Vanessa not sure but anyway the woman the other woman's husband calls Lucy and tells her about this and when she confronts her husband Jake he does not deny it and you know and at first i'm reading this and i'm thinking okay i know this story i know how this ends but then it takes a really crazy twist which is that they agree that lucy can hurt jake three times and he doesn't necessarily need to know about it um and she doesn't she doesn't tell him but that's their deal is that she gets to hurt him three times um but all during this whole time that she is they're going about their lives and that they're staying together and all that it, the, this idea of the harpy is interwoven um and lucy had done some work in grad school i believe um that draws on this and so it's all interconnected and it's fantastic and i loved it and I thought that that was great. Um, anyway, I don't have too much more on that one. And then finally, my final book of um, for my best fiction of 2020 is Wild Blues by Beth Kephart. Um, Beth is someone who I consider a friend. I should say that as a disclaimer. Um, I, I know her personally. I think that I've loved her writing for decades now um this is i don't know what book this is of hers she has written nearly two dozen books for uh, adults and young readers and this is a middle grade book um again something i do not normally read i normally don't read um i don't read a lot of ya i, I read some but not a lot of it uh and i, I definitely don't read uh, anywhere near enough middle grade books but anyway this is a middle grade book it is about a girl um, 13 year old Lizzie and her mother is um, undergoing cancer treatments which I just realized the same as in pretty things which you know I guess that's that it's like some subconscious theme that I was drawn to or whatever but anyway Wild Blues um, so mother is undergoing cancer treatments and for the summer she asks Lizzie what she wants to do for the summer. Um, she has to choose um, whether to, I guess, stay with her mother and or or to go with um, spend the summer at her uncle Davy's house, which is in the um, in the Adirondacks. So her uncle Davy is quite a character. He is very solitary. There's been a falling out between Uncle Davy and Lizzie's mom and so the novel talks about you know those kinds of family estrangements and you know how 
and the feelings of being caught between them. Um, so anyway, so he is also like a, a collector of things. He, you know, he frequents the flea markets. He has a, a, a his car is like a 69, yeah, a 1969 something or other. Anyway, um, so he is this, it's this fascinating story about um, her relationship with her uncle and her her summer friend, um, Mateus. And Mateus is uh, a young boy and he is from, so, he's from, I want to say like somewhere in like South America. Um, Anyway, and he has proportional dwarfism, and so he carries like a, a little pack of and like a little like stool and crutches. And anyway, so they meet up at a rock, and that's like their spot. And they hang out and they talk. And uh, he tells her Lizzie about his country, and um, Lizzie tell talks to him about her life and. They just have this really wonderful, special bond together. And one so one day in the summer, there is a prison break. And there's a prison about like 30 miles or so away from where, um, where Uncle Davy's cabin is. And um, so Lizzie is on her way to meet Mateus. And she realizes that he's not there. And she finds these clues along the way that makes her believe that something has happened to him. And at the same time, um, you know, these prisoners have broken out of prison. Um, they've cut like a hole through the wall and they've escaped through tunnels. And um, anyway, it is extremely tense. I stayed up probably, I think I went to bed like one night at like 10 o'clock and I was up reading this until about one. Um, could not put it down. It is absolutely fascinating. I've seen some reviews say that this might be a little bit too intense for um, middle grade students. It might be more YA. I, I tend to agree with that because I think that there are some themes in here that, you know, that might be a little bit too much for, for a younger reader. But for a very mature Middle grade reader, absolutely. I think that this would be great. Like I said, Beth is a friend. Her writing is very poetic. It's very lyrical. Um, I found that to be true in other works of hers, uh, more so than this one. This one seemed to be a little bit um, more, I don't want to say less poetic, or because that makes it seem like her writing is diminished in some way, but it is, it's definitely not. But anyway, so I wanted to um, make sure that I highlighted this. Like I said, Beth is a friend. Um, she is a writing mentor of mine. Um, I, I think the world of her. And I'm so glad to include Wild Blues as one of my um, best fictions of 2020. Anyway, so that about wraps it up. This is a much longer video than I had intended, mainly because of my preamble uh, at the beginning. Um, I debated even doing this one today because like I said it's the day after the um, the attempted coup because that's what it was on the capital and uh, you know on our country and um, but I felt like I wanted to say something about it and I also wanted to talk about the best books of 20 my best fictions of 2020 um, because I think that first of all the, these books and particularly the white card that I mentioned reflect the reality of what we're living in and I feel like as always books are a powerful way for us to understand um, you know different worlds and different cultures and different people than we might encounter in our everyday life so anyway thank you so much for watching if you liked this video um, please hit the like button below thumbs up and um, subscribe if you are interested. I really appreciate the great support from all um, my in-person friends and uh, everyone from BookTube for a warm welcome so far. And I will see you again in my next video. Thanks again. Bye.